I will always keep my videos here free. The only thing that I ask from you is to like and subscribe to my page. And also check me out on Patreon. Thank you so much. This video, we're going to be going over the cervical spine anatomy. Anybody can use this video, but it's catered towards osteopathic medical students. But anybody can really use this video because anatomy doesn't change anywhere you go. So first, let's just take a look at this 3D model of the cervical spine. As you can see, there's seven part, there's seven vertebral levels, but they're not all the same. And we're going to go into each level to show you some of the differences. So these first two vertebral levels, the atlas and the axis are atypical. They're not normal vertebral levels, but the rest of them are pretty typical, except for the last one, C7, there's a slight difference, which we'll go over. It's not that important for the complex, but we'll go over it. And here's kind of an overview before we look at each segment. You have the transverse process, you have these inferior articulate processes as well as the superior processes. And hopefully this will make more sense when we go over each level. We also have the spinous processes, which are these little extensions that come out at the back. We have these transverse processes that come out of the side. So first let's look at a typical vertebral level. So first we have this pedicle right here. The pedicle along with the lamina contribute to this posterior arch over here, what I'm drawing here in blue. We also have the spinous process right here, which is a bony extension that comes out of the back. Basically, the spinous process in a typical vertebral level is this bifid, which means it has these two pieces that are sticking out that way. Now, there's a lot of them, a lot of spinous processes in the back are not like that. They're just a single one, but this one in typical cervical vertebral levels, they're bifid. You have this inferior articular process. That's this part. We call that in the inferior articular process because it's going to articulate with the bottom joint. So if you remember this inferior articular process over here, it's basically making a connection with the joint right underneath. This is kind of what makes up what's known as the articular pillars. Basically, when you're palpating a patient's cervical spine, as an osteopathic physician, you're really focusing on these connections or this articular pillar. These pillars will be helpful in assessing the motion of the cervical spine and figuring out where the position of ease is or where the position of restriction is in a patient. So let's take a look at these pedicles really quickly in three dimensions. Here this label is pointing at this pedicle. So if you notice right above it there's a little hole and right below it there's also a little hole right here. These holes above and below the pedicles these are basically helpful in forming intervertebral foramina which will be important for the nervous system. Also, all of these transverse processes, they're going to be important for the vertebral arteries. They're basically going to allow the passage of the vertebral arteries. So we've said so far that there's seven cervical vertebrae. Some of them are typical. Some of them are atypical. So the typical ones all have a vertebral body. They all have bifid spinous processes. And they all have a posterior arch. I remember we said these were C3 to C6. Okay, but what about C1, C2, and C7? Here is C1, and as you can tell, C1 looks a little bit different than the other one. It's kind of a weird looking shape. Notice there's nothing in the middle like we had before. There was no vertebral body, and also C1 has no spinous process. So if you notice really quickly, this is different compared to C5. And also, C5 has this vertebral body, which we don't have at all over here. So that's very different in C1. Notice also there's this anterior arch over here that does not exist in a typical vertebrae. Then we have C2, which is known as the axis. And this one looks kind of weird too. It does have a spinous process, but it has this weird thing called the dens. So it just kind of sticks out. Looks kind of weird. And that's pretty unique, and it makes it an atypical vertebral level. If we go back to this picture, you'll notice this axis. This is how it connects with C1 at the top. So the reason that C1, it turns out, doesn't have this vertebral body in the middle is so that the second vertebral body, the axis, and the dens is able to fit, is able to go through and communicate with the first vertebral body. So just to show you the difference, here was C2. Here was C1. C2 is unique. It has this weird thing called the dens. And it also does have a spinous process. 
as opposed to C1, which does not have a spinous process. So the only difference with C1, it has, well, that's pretty bright, man. It has no body, it has no spinous process, and it also has a anterior arch. So basically I'm comparing these to the typical vertebral levels. The only difference with C2 is it has a dense. Otherwise, everything else is just like this. The only difference with C7 is it has a prominent spinous process and it's not bifid. So notice right here, the spinous process is very different than the other ones. It's not bifid and it's pretty prominent. That's actually, you can palpate it on yourself and that's how you know that you're at C7. So quick overview, these are the vertebral levels. The first one is very unique, so is the second one. We went over those, and then we have the typical vertebral levels, and C7, the only difference is the spinous process. For the osteopathic student, there's also some relevant muscles in the cervical region. We have the scalene muscles, this posterior one that's highlighted. There's the middle scalene, and there's the anterior scalene. Now, if you notice, these are coming from the cervical vertebral levels, and it's attaching to these ribs. So if you look at the scalene muscle, this is the posterior scalene. This is attaching to the second rib right there. The other scalene muscles are going to be attaching to the first rib. When you unilaterally contract these muscles, like just on one side, you'll see that they're side bending to the same side. But if they both work at the same time, then you have this flexion of the neck. So I have highlighted here the anterior scalene muscles. Now because of where these attach, again the anterior and the middle are attaching to the first rib and the posterior is attaching to the second rib. They're also used in respiration. So the anterior and the middle usually help elevate the first rib during inhalation like if it's a really forced inhalation, and the posterior scalene will help elevate the second rib during forced inhalation. A lot of times you might have a tender point in one of the scalenes with a first or a second inhalation rib dysfunction. So to review, these scalene muscles, they come from the cervical vertebrae, they originate from the cer cervical vertebrae, and they insert onto rib one and rib two rib two for posterior. Their action is to, if it's unilateral, it's side bends, and if it's bilateral, it flexes. Then we also have the sternocleidomastoid muscle. This muscle originates from the mastoid process, and it inserts onto the clavicle and sternum. So again, as we can see here, the highlighted is sternocleidomastoid. It's coming from the mastoid process to the clavicle and the sternum. And there's these two heads here at the bottom. During unilateral contraction, you have what's known as side bending towards and rotate away. So I remember that as star. So I just think of a star on my SCM. And I always remember side bend towards and rotate away. Bilaterally, if they're both working, then it's just gonna be neck flexion like before. So unilateral, I remember this as star, which reminds me side bend towards, rotate away. One note with this is shortening or restriction in the SCM will cause torticollis. I think they like to ask that question on exams. Then we have these ligaments that are important in the cervical region. There's the alar ligament and there's the transverse ligament. So you'll see here the alar ligament is actually coming from the dens, and in other words, it's coming from C2 or the axis bone. The transverse ligament is coming from the atlas, and it's just crossing over the dens, but you see that originates from the atlas. So here it is close up. Here's your transverse ligament, and here's your alar ligaments. Basically, if you remember transverse is the one that just goes this way, then you can remember that the other one is the other one. The reason we bring up these ligaments is because different pathologies like rheumatoid arthritis or Down syndrome can actually weaken these ligaments. And because it weakens these ligaments, you can have some kind of subluxation between these 
two bones. And if that happens, then you're going to have some kind of neurologic damage. So a lot of times you might get a question that asks you, a patient might have Down syndrome or RA and you want to avoid some kind of direct treatments or, a, or like an HVLA or something that would potentially cause problems in that cervical region. Next, we'll talk about a special kind of joint called the oncovertebral joint. And these originate from C3 through C7. So here, what's highlighted in purple are the on the lateral margins of the of the vertebral bodies are known as unconnect processes. It forms a kind of joint. So here, we're, here's the unconnect process that I'm talking about. So basically, we have the shape here, and that's one vertebral body, and then this other one right above it, it forms this kind of joint right here. These are known as uncovertebral joints. Some people also call them joints of Lushka. I don't know how you spell this guy's name. I think it's like this. But it's basically called, also known as joints of Lushka. A couple notes on these. They're important for side bending. So if you get a question that says, what's the importance of the joints of Lushka? They protect against any problems when you're side bending. They basically give some stability. And remember, these are from C3 to C7. Also, since they're very close to the intervertebral foramen, so here's the uncovertebral joint. Since these are so close to these intervertebral foramen, any kind of degenerative changes here can cause stenosis, and these are where the nerves are coming out, so it can cause stenosis and some kind of nervous system problem, some kind of radiculopathy or something with the nerve roots. So all right, degeneration can cause spinal stenosis. In fact, one of the most common causes of cervical nerve pressure or stenosis is degeneration of these joints and also hypertrophic arthritis of the facet joints. Basically, between this joint right here, which is the uncovertebral joint or joint of Lushka, and these joints, either side can have some kind of inflammatory changes. And then once they do that, they can impinge on this intervertebral foramen and cause some kind of stenosis and problems with the nerve roots. So that question comes up sometimes. They might be like, what happens if you have hypertrophic changes or degenerative changes in the uncovertebral joints? This brings me to my next topic of cervical nerves. And we'll look at these really quickly over here. Here's like the first cervical nerve. Here's like the second cervical nerve, the third cervical nerve. And what you'll notice is each of these nerves is exiting between like, let's say we look at this one, this is C2 and this is C3. And you'll notice that C3 is exiting between C2 and C3. So if you have like foramen stenosis between C2 and C3, then you know that C3 is going to be affected. For example, here's C4, and then you'll see right above C4 is C3, and right above below it is C4. So if you get a question that says there's a problem between C3 and C4, there's some kind of stenosis or something, what nerve is going to get affected, then it's going to be C4. So basically, anytime you have a question that says there's a problem between C3 and C4, you'll have to know automatically that it's going to be this nerve that's going to be affected. If it's C4 to C5, I already know this nerve is going to be affected. If it's C5 to C6, I already know that nerve is going to be affected. So I, you just pick the higher number, basically. Now, we're not going to go over all the innervations and stuff in this video in terms of motor innervations or sensory innervations. A pretty high yield is they like to ask about some kind of sensory issue and it's important to know the distribution of the dermatomes. So basically, if you had a question that says there's an issue between C5 and C6, where do you expect the patient to have a sensory loss? Since we know C5 and C6, I know that it's going to be an issue with the C6 nerve and here's the C6 distribution. So I'm going to pick an answer that includes the C6 distribution. So the answer could be like, patient has a loss of sensation along the radial aspect of the hand or, or arm or something. The way I remember these is I know I start with six on the thumb side and the ulnar side is C8. So the thumb and ulnar side are even numbers and the middle one is C7. So then you can quickly remember this part is C6, the middle is C7, and this part is C8. Then I can go backwards from there. So before this is C5, after this is T1, but they really rarely ask about C5 and T1. I think this is pretty high yield over here. Now again, we didn't talk about the motor losses because it's possible that you have a motor problem 
So then you have to know what's most likely to affect the radial nerve or the median nerve. But in my experience, the sensation is, is very high yield. So in this video, we've talked about the seven vertebral bodies in the cervical region. Here's a kind of overview picture of the seven. We know that there's typical and there's atypical. We know that C2 is pretty unique. C1 is pretty unique. This is an example of the typical ones. We talked about the scalenes. They both come from the cervical vertebral bodies. One inserts on one, the other inserts on two. We talked about their actions. Sometimes just by knowing the actions of the muscle, you might get some questions right. The SCM, we talked about. We talked about that action. We talked about a problem that can happen with the SCM. There's also these ligaments that are issues with rheumatoid or Down syndrome. We talked about these uncovertebral joints, which here's a better picture of them. These joints right here. We talked about that they're important in side bending, degeneration can cause spinal stenosis. And finally, we talked about these nerve distributions.